even in Denver, Colorado, getting even with Max the waiter. But we had a lot of uh, stuff in the, in the nave that was very special to Brooklyn. And one of them was the candy store. The candy store was like the, uh, it was like the community center. Uh, we didn't have a community center in, in our neighbor, but Al and Shirley's candy store was like a community center. And in Al and Shirley's, you can get anything you wanted, including comic books and so on and so forth. But the best thing were the beverages. And there were actually two favorite beverages. One of them was the egg cream, which didn't have an egg in it, and it didn't have cream in it, but it had... Fox's, you bet, chocolate syrup. It had salsa and it had milk. And it was made in such a way where the uh, candy store guy, Al, would tip the Coca-Cola glass. It was a little Coca-Cola. It had to be glass. Couldn't have it with plastic. And put the milk in, put the Fox's, you bet, in, and put the seltzer in. But when he put the seltzer in, he had to use a spoon so the spoon would deflect the seltzer and you get a about a, a half an inch of cream on the top. It was the greatest. Egg cream was a nickel and it was only a chocolate egg cream. Anybody who had a vanilla cream, egg cream didn't know what he was talking about. Chocolate egg cream. And then there was the other drink because we were poor. It's called a two cents plain. And for two cents, you got the same Coke bottle only with seltzer. And believe me, two cents money was very popular with us because it was cold and it was cheap, you know, and that was, uh, that was it. The other thing about uh, Alan Shirley's candy store was a very interesting thing. And again, I'm talking about 1942, right? A lot of people didn't have telephones, so they relied on the candy store. So if somebody, somebody, uh, let's say uh, Jerry Abel's, Jerry Abel would get a phone call at 7 Vernon Avenue, and the phone call would come to the candy store. So whatever the kid was around, they had to run to Jerry Abel's house, bring him down, give him the phone, he'd take care of his phone call, and he'd give the kid either a penny or a nickel, maximum. Or well, one day, I'm in the candy store, and one of these guys, a guy named Cone, who lived in the middle of the block, he got a call. I run to Cone's house. I bring him to the uh, candy store. He gets his phone call. He gets done. And I couldn't believe what happened. He put a half a buck in my, in my hand. That was unheard of. He leaves the store, and I go over to Shirley, the Shirley of Alan Shirley's candy store. I say, what the hell's going on? This guy gave me a half a buck. Who is he? He says, she says that he's the new book on Vernon Avenue. And that's why he gave me a half a buck which I thought was a great event in my life. Among uh, other things, and by the way, I don't know when you want to ask questions or not, because obviously I'll take any questions you have. But one of my, uh, one of my favorite stories is a prop. And I'm going to show you the prop, and then I'm going to tell you the story, okay? Here's the prop. I hope you can all, can you all see it? Yes. Okay, you can see the prop. Okay, these are bookends, right? So one of the great things at PS54, at least for me, was shop. And the guy who ran shop was a fellow who would have been best played by Jimmy Cagney, the, the actor. His name was Mr. Montague. He was, he was very tough. And at PS54 in 1942, I must tell you, they were very strict with conduct. There was no kidding around anymore the way it is these days. Uh, you, you were in trouble. And one way you get in trouble was if you get caught by any teacher and the teacher gives you a demerit. You get a demerit, that was a bad thing. Because if you wound up with five demerits, you get left back, which was a, a real sin. So we're in this uh, in uh, class, and uh, we were working on these these bookends, okay? And Mr. Montague had a very interesting technique. When he got angry at somebody, instead of raising his voice and yelling, he would lower his voice. And one of the guys who happened to be uh, 
in our class and a big favorite of mine and the rest of the guys. He was an African-American guy named Ralph Hubbard. And Ralphie later on became a hero in the Korean War and was a longtime friend of mine until he passed away. Anyhow, Ralphie was one of the three or four guys who liked to kid around. It was Ralphie, it was me, it was Neil Brown and Joe Fatiri. And in this particular day, Montague, as in Jimmy Cagney in White Heat, Montague caught Ralphie fooling around. And he looked at Ralph and he lowered, it, lowered his voice and he said, D, D, D. One, two, three. And poor Ralphie got three demerits, otherwise known as a hat trick, three demerits at one shot, which left him only too short of being left back. And that was, that was one of the scariest things that ever happened to me in my whole years at PS54. But the scarier one happened to me and Neil Brown, who also was a very dear friend of mine, so we were working on the bookends, and the bookends were all done. Everything was done on the bookends. We had the name, you know, we were, had the initials carved in. Mine was, of course, SF on it. And the only thing that was missing was the shellacking. And the shellacking took place two weeks before the end of school, which was the beginning of June. And uh, one day... We're in school, in the shop, and Brownie and I get caught by Mr. Montague. Goes like this, he says, Mr. Brown and Mr. Fischler, please come up to the front of the room and do bring the bookends with you. So we bring the bookends up. We're very, very frightened by this whole episode. We bring the bookends, he takes the bookends away from me. And then, uh, I was, and then he gives them back and he said, I want you to do one thing. I want you to take the bookends and each of you give them a big kiss. And do you know why you're going to kiss them? Because you are giving them a kiss goodbye. They are going to the nuns at St. Lucy's Church on Kent Avenue. And of course, we give them a big kiss and we went back to our seats and we were crushed because... This was two weeks before we were going to bring one of our favorite, favorite shop things back home. So now the class is over and Brownie and I are practically uh, in tears. And just before we leave, Montague says, come back up. I want to talk to you. And we go back up and he says, Mr. Brown and Mr. Fischler, did you learn your lesson? And we said, yes, Mr. Montague. And he gave the bookends back to us. <laughs> That's why these bookends are still with me as the, the great Mr. Montague. That's it. Back. Oh, yeah. It says on the back. I still have the thing on the back. Something. Anyhow, uh, 54 was a great experience for me. And, uh, and so was a lot, of, a lot of other stories. I must tell you a story about my dad and uh, how... Uh, money was very, very tight in our house. My dad took me to uh, baseball games whenever he could. Took me to Evans Field to see the Brooklyn Dodgers. And when the Dodgers were on the road, we went to see the Bushwicks. The Bushwicks were a semi-pro team and played in a beautiful ballpark on the border of Brooklyn and Queens called Dexter Park. And the great thing about going to Dexter Park was the fact that we were able to see all the great black teams. They played the Bushwicks. The Bushwicks were a white team. This is in 42. This is uh, way before Jackie Robinson. In fact, we did see Jackie Robinson at Dexter Park uh, playing for Kansas City. We saw the great Satchel Page pitching for the Homestead Grays, pitched the first game of a doubleheader, and then the second game. Second game. Imagine that. And won both of them. And we also went to see the Dodgers whenever we could. And my favorite Dodger was Joe Medwick. He played left field. And we were sitting in the uh, left field grandstands. And I think this was a night game, actually. Anyhow, a guy hits a line drive to left field, and it was an impossible catch. And all of a sudden, Joe, his nickname was Ducky, by the way. 
Ducky Medwick doesn't die for the puck, for the ball. He slides, he slides, and unbelievably, he slid enough to actually catch the ball in his love. And that, to me, that was the greatest thing I'd ever seen in baseball up until that point in my time. And of course, I was a big Joe Medwick fan before, now even more so. So about two weeks later, my father and I went to see the Bushwicks. And after the game, we would hop on the BMT Broadway Brooklyn line, change for the Myrtle Avenue line, get off at downtown Brooklyn. We'd go to the Automat, which was a ritual. The Automat, I'm sure some of you may remember for, you get just, just about everything, but you had to have nickels. Most of the things you had to use and put a nickel in, blah, blah, blah. So we get done with, we get done with dinner. I always had uh, cream spinach, mashed potatoes, and sometimes mashed turnips, which was a very interesting and a good item for me. Otherwise, it was baked beans, which was a, came in a little uh, container. It was very good stuff. But the whole point of the deal is we get done and we walk out into Fulton Street. And as we turn left to go to the subway, I discover right right next to, right next to the automat was a sporting goods store that I had never noticed before, little one. And I said, Pop, I want to look in the window here. So I, I'm looking in the window. You couldn't see everything because it was it had a little gate, but you could see enough. And what I saw was enough for me to see. There in the window was an ox blood colored Joe Medwick autographed outfielder's glove. And I, I was absolutely captivated by it. And I, I said, dad, dad, dad. And I pointed to it and I said, I'd love to have that Joe Medwick glove. Can you buy it for me? And my dad took a look and he says, no, I can't, I can't get it for you. I said, why not, why not? He says, you see the price? It's six dollars. Six dollars. I don't have. I don't care if there's a Joe DiMaggio glove. Can't. I can't. I can't get it. So I was crushed. So now I go home, and I'm trying to figure out what kind of plan I can call my old man to get that Joe Medwick glove. And about a week later, I went to camp. I used to go to camp for three weeks. Went to charity camps, and this one was called the Pythian Camp. Uh, it was a great, great camp up in uh, Glens Bay, New York, near the Delaware River. And I figured once I'm away at camp, I write letters, my parents write letters, and my mother was fantastic. My mother was actually the reason why I became a writer because she was the great writer of the family. She'd write to cousins and everybody in the family. She kept the, kept the whole family together that way. And I was, well, you know, I'd, I'd watch her and see she, see her write. And I guess uh, by osmosis, I became, uh, watching my mom became a writer. So anyhow, what happened was I go to camp and every day I'm getting a, a postcard or a letter from my mom, except two of the days on the weekend, my dad would send me a letter. But in, in addition to the letter, he would send clippings from the Daily News, the World Telegram, all about baseball and mostly all about the Dodgers. So about a weekend, I figure absence makes the heart go fonder, grow fonder. So I'm going to try my, my best to uh, pull at the heartstrings. And I write a letter to my father. I said, Dad, I'm having a great time up here and I'm really hitting the ball well which I was, <laughs> and I said, Dad, uh, can you get me that Joe Medwick glove that we saw in the sporting goods store? And he writes back, I told you before, we can't afford it and you cannot have the glove. So that was that. And a couple more weeks go by and it's about two or three days before the end of camp and I write back the same thing and I get another no. So that was that. Now I come home, back home, and you know, when the kid comes home from camp for about three hours, 
they love you, they love you, they love you, you're <laughs> back and it's a happy, happy, happy thing. And they tried one more try with the Joe Medwick glove. He says, tomorrow I'm going to take you to Jay's. Jay's was a very popular uh, stationary sporting goods store on Nostrand Avenue, Brooklyn, near Gates. I knew it well. He says, I'm going to take you to Jay's and I'm going to give you $3. And you can get any glove you want for $3. And sure enough, in the window, there was a yellow, disgusting looking, no autographed outfielder's glove. And it was the only thing that I could get. So I bought it. I took it, came home with it. And maybe about two or three weeks later, the gang, once a month, we would go to the parade grounds, which was the only place we could play baseball. And it meant taking the trolley car and uh, doing a little walking. And I brought my uh, my new $3 disgusting glove with me. And we did our little playing baseball. And now it's time to go home. And we decided to take a shortcut to the Lorma Street trolley by going through the back part of Prospect Park. It was... A, one area was kind of forestry. It was, it was neat for a kid from Brooklyn to go into a place like that. And we're going through the woods and all of a sudden, a gang descended on us, a genuine gang of about seven or eight kids. And we got mugged, <laughs> plain and simple. We got, we got mugged. And one of the stupid guys who mugged us, mugged me, grabbed my $3 yellow disgusting glove and took it with him. And I was the happiest guy to get mugged that ever walked in Prospect Park because I got rid of that, that glove. And interestingly enough, not long after that, I never did get the Joe Medwick glove. Never, never, ever got it. And it broke my heart, but I had to get used to that one. Like my mom said, you got to grin and bear it. So the grinning part of it was... For my birthday, my best friend, Howie Sparrow, who figures into many of the chapters, by the way, Howie Sparrow, uh, without knowing anything about the what I would want, uh, he bought me a an oxblood colored first baseman's mitt. Now, it wasn't the Joe Medwick uh, uh, glove, but for our purposes, it was the second best thing. And that's because in those days, there were no cars around on the road. It was you know, World War II, gas rationing, and of course, the neighborhood was pretty poor. So Vernon Avenue, where we played punch ball, if it had about three cars on the block, it was a big deal. And I'll tell you this, if any car parked on our punch ball court, you know what we would do? First of all, nobody locked the cars in those days. So we'd We'd reach in or open the door if the window wasn't open, and we release the uh, emergency brake, and we push the car maybe ten year, ten yards off the punch ball court, and leave it there, and that was it. And then we we'd play our game. So having a, punch ball was a big thing on on Vernon Avenue. It was a big thing in in the summer from April until September. Punch ball was great. So. One of the guys, or two of the guys from time to time, we called the big guys. I mean, it was my gang, we were 10 years old, or maybe uh, nine, 10, or maybe 11, but there was always the big guys. And the big guys were guys who were two or more years older. These were the guys we called the big guys. And every once in a while, they'd uh, join us in a game. So in this particular punch ball game, one of the big guys, his name was Murray Matlin, and a very likable guy. We, he's a redhead. We call him Red, Red Matlin. And Red Matlin was significant for two reasons. One, he was the only guy in the block when we were in a race would walk with his hands next to his hips. And nobody else ran like Murray Matlin. And he also happened to be the fastest guy on Vernon Avenue. And he also was one of the top two or three punch ball players. So he was in our game and I was playing first base, which was right next to one curb. And third base was on the other side and second base was all the way down by a sewer. And then there was home. So Murray Matlin gets up 
which was already scary, right? Because he's such a great punch bowl player. Murray gets up and he punches one. It was like a laser. And I know it was coming to my right, my right. And I had my oxblood colored first baseman's mitt on my left. But just for the hell of it, I knew I wasn't going to make the catch. But just for the hell of it, I go like this with my mitt. And a miracle happened. It caught the ball. Actually got Murray Red Matlin out with that oxblood colored first baseman's mitt. And if anything helped me forget about the Joe Medwick autograph glove, it was that mitt. And I always treasured for the rest of the time that I ever played punch ball. And punch ball, of course, required a, a special kind of ball in those days, which was called the Spaldine which was made by the AG Spalding Company, but we called it a Spalding in Brooklyn. And it was very hard to get uh, official Spaldings during the war because they were made of rubber. And uh, rubber was uh, needed for the war effort. And uh, we'd have to find, we had to find other kinds of balls. And I, had, I was very lucky because my uncle Ed was an avid tennis player and he would give me his used tennis balls every so often. But one day, my best friend Howie and I were in, uh, we were not in our favorite Alan Shirley's candy store. For some reason, we were in Goldstein's candy store. Now, Goldstein's candy store was, written, was run by an old guy. I should talk, right? I'm 90 years old. But Mr. Goldstein was an older guy to us. And it was, it was a strange kind of candy store because unlike Alan Shirley's, he actually had games, not many, but he had games and he kept them on the shelf, very dusty, of course, because there's very few bought any games from uh, Goldstein. And all of a sudden, Howie and I had come back. I think we came back from the movies and for some reason we went into Goldstein's store and we couldn't believe what we were seeing. We were seeing on one of the shelves what two Spaldines. It was, it was, you know, it was almost like a fantasy. And uh, how he says to uh, Mr. Goldstein, uh, can we see one of those Spaldines up there? And he gives it to Howie, shows it to me. I said, well, we got, we got to see uh, if this is, if this is for real and why it wouldn't be. So we bounced it a couple of times. We bounced it and it bounced perfectly. And we said to Mr. Goldstein, <laughs> this is exactly what happened. Mr. Goldstein, this, is this Spaulding for real? And he looked at us as if we were stupid. And his answer was, real? It's the real McCoy. <laughs> I'll never forget that. It was the real McCoy. And of course, we I don't know, I guess it was a... 10 cents in those days, but we, we actually got this great sport. It was a wonderful thing. I want to tell you about uh, uh, VJ Day because VJ Day was a very special uh, day in my life. My best friend Howie, his parents, uh, Sally and Sidney Sparra, uh, got wealthy by our standards uh, pretty quickly. Uh, they have started a pickle and mayonnaise business and it developed into spare way, S-P-A-R-E hyphen way, food products. And they had a factory about five blocks away from my house. The factory was on uh, DeKalb Avenue, corner of Marcy, right across the street from the SNL Deli, where Max the Waiter told me, you know, there's a war on. Uh, so they they were making uh, pretty good bucks during the war, pretty good bucks, and enough for them to rent a summer home in Seagate. Now, Seagate was a very special part of Brooklyn. It was the very tip of Coney Island, and it was a gated community. So if you wanted to go visit somebody in Seagate, you had to stop at the uh, gate tell them uh, who you were and who you were visiting before you can get in. So the Sparrows had this nice uh, uh, summer home at Seagate. 
And I used to go there and visit Howie uh, very often, very often. In fact, I had a lot of good stories in the book about Seagate. Anyhow, so now it's uh, August 1945. We already knew that the uh, atomic bomb hit Hiroshima. We knew about the uh, hydrogen, whatever the second bomb was called, that hit uh, Nagasaki. And everybody sensed that uh, the war was going to be over, we thought or hoped, pretty soon. We weren't sure. So now it's the morning, and Howie and I would at uh, the beach, gone for a swim. He came out from a swim. All of a sudden, Sally Sparrow, Howie's mom, is yelling, come here, come here, come here. And we go running up the house, and she tells us that the war is over. War is over. And that instantly meant there had to be some sort of celebration, and the Sparrows had a very big family. So the word went out. Everybody has to come to the house in the afternoon. Is it going to be a big, a big celebration, which there was. And a very interesting thing, uh, aspect of the celebration was that if there were, if there were any soldier around at, at a time like that, you had to bring him in as part of the celebration. So uh, Howie's big sister, Norma, was a very, very attractive girl. I think she was about maybe uh, 19 or so, and uh, and very, uh, as I said, very attractive. And of course, she was there for the the, uh, the great party. And it turned out that the soldier that they uh, found nearby happened to be uh, Morris Gold. And Morris Gold wound up marrying <laughs> Norma Spara. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a, it was a great marriage, as it turned out, because it went from the mayonnaise and pickle family to Gold's horseradish. This was the gold of, of Gold's Gold's horseradish. What wonderful uh, wonderful coincidence. Meantime, so the party is going on, and of course Howie and I, you know, we uh, uh, partook of everything, and then suddenly uh, Howie's mom says to, to me and Howie. Uh, listen, guys, uh, I want to take you. I want to take you to uh, to Coney. Join the celebration. And uh, Sally Sparrow then uh, drove what was a very very attractive car, even though it was 1937. It was called a Packard. Packard was a very classy car then, and uh, you know, it was in the same level of a caddy. So uh, Sally drives us to Coney, parks underneath the uh, Coney, uh, the elevated. And she took us to a, uh, a Chinese restaurant. Now, up until that time, the only Chinese meal which I would have uh, probably once or twice a month was egg drop soup, chicken chow mein, and an almond cookie. And the tea was always free. Now, I never had anything that deviated from egg drop soup, chicken chow mein, and an almond cookie. And now we were in this Chinese restaurant that was a little bit uh, higher class than the one on Tompkins Avenue. And the waiter comes and gives us the menu, and I'm looking at these exotic things that I had never heard of before. And the one thing that caught my eye, if you don't mind it uh, not being kosher, was shrimp in lobster sauce. And I, I said, Jesus. Uh, Shrimp and lobster. How can I not have chicken chow mein? But I'm not, you know, I'm not in Yi Ping Hing on Tompkins Avenue. I'm in this uh, semi fancy joint underneath the L. So I ordered shrimp and lobster sauce, and it was like one of the greatest discoveries of my young life. We finished this great meal, and now Sally takes us to uh, all the great things in Coney. And one of the great things in Coney was the Bowery where they had all these different kind of things, including skee-ball. Now, skee-ball was uh, uh, for, uh, I think it was uh, no more than a nickel. It might even have been a uh, penny. No, I think it was a nickel. Anyway, you put a nickel in, you pull the lever, and out comes uh, five ball, wooden balls, and you rolled them, and you had to get them into one of three holes. And if you did well, you'd get a, a coupon. If you got it in the middle hole, which was a hundred thing, you were uh, 
real good. Anyhow, we played our ski ball, and then uh, she took us uh, to, of course, we had to go to Nathan's, we had a hot dog, and then, then was the, the big thrill of all. The big thrill of all, we'd never been on a roller coaster before. Coney had a lot of roller coasters. The greatest of all was the cyclone, which was too scary for us at that time. But across the street from the cyclone was actually the first roller coaster that Coney had. And it was called, it was so old, it was called the F and M Thompson Scenic Railway. They didn't even call it a roller coaster, but it was a roller coaster. And now it was at night. And we decided that we were gonna try. We had no idea what it was like. And the th thing about the F and M Thompson roller coaster is that it went underneath the elevated tracks, then it came out, and this was in this was dark, you know, it was nighttime. Went up, and then of course came the first hole. Now, of course, we had not been a roll on a roller coaster ever in our lives. And I have to tell you, this was one of the greatest scary things, greatest because we survived it. Most exciting ride up until that time in my life. And uh, it was so great. We did it a second time because we didn't think it was that real. It was so great. And that was it. That was that was how we celebrated BJ Day at, uh, at Coney Island. Now, I must tell you, I have a lot of great Coney Island stories in the, in the book, but the one that uh, was another... Uh, downer, it was a, it was, what did I say? It was a good news and bad news. So when I, when I was visiting Howie at Seagate every once in a while, you know, we go to Coney and uh, we go to the Penny Arcade and the Penny Arcade was great because for a penny, it could get all kinds of great games, including uh, old time pinball machines. It was wonderful, wonderful. Penny Arcades were just a great, great thing for a kid. But anyhow, now we're on the boardwalk the boardwalk and we were walking past the steeplechase, which was another terrific place to visit, to, to rides. And we see something that we had never noticed before right off the boardwalk. And it was called steeplechase poker. Actually, this was in the morning. It's about 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. And we said, what the hell is this? Let's go in and try it out. And we go in. And this was uh, an, another one of these nickel deals. And the deal was for a nickel, you got three balls and you had to throw them underneath the glass. And there were different, uh, you know, it was like the ace of spades and so on and so on and so on and so on. And if you got two of a kind, you got a coupon. Now, it was one of these days when Lady Luck was looking on us because we would we were just getting things like unbelievable. And the difference was that if you got a coupon at Steeplechase Poker, it wasn't like the chintzy stuff at the ski ball where you, if you were lucky with ski ball and you got a, uh, you know, uh, maybe a, uh, some cheap pen or something like that, there was, you could get good stuff at, uh, with the coupons and we got done this is what I got because I thought this was a wonderful thing to bring home for mother. First of all, there was a salt and paper, salt and uh, pepper shakers. That was number one. Number two was a large pitcher for like uh, orange juice or whatever. And the great thing, the coup de gras, the absolutely great thing was a sugar dispenser that had a cone shape on the top, a red, it was a red cover. And if you turned it like this, and then not like this, it measured one spoonful of sugar. So if you wanted two spoonfuls, you did it once, and then you did it twice. I thought this was a fantastic invention. So I'm, what I'm bringing home to mom is salt and pepper shaker, great pitcher, and this uh, wonderful sugar dispenser. And I, I figured this is gonna be a, a great thing. It would, it would justify my going to Howie's and going to, to Steeplechase Poker. Now to get home, 
from there from Coney. I had to take the uh, uh, Brighton Express. And I always like to be in the front car because you could open the window and stick your head out. But when I got on at Stillwell Avenue, which was the last stop, it meant there was going to be crowd coming in on West 8th Street. There'd be another one at Ocean Parkway. And then the third one would be Brighton Beach. And it was going to be very crowded. And my three gifts were in a brown paper bag. And I'm holding it because now the, pay, the subway is getting crowded. I'm protecting it like a, a fullback in the NFL. And I managed to get him home. Nothing got broke. And I walk into the living room and I said, Mom, uh, look what I got for you from Coney Island. Of course, she doesn't know what's happening. I pull out the salt, salt and pepper shaker. And she looks at it. And she says, uh, what's that? And of course, she's pointing to the salt and pepper shaker on the dining room table. She was not impressed. I was subdued, to say the least. So I pull out the big orange juice, or the whatever you call the pitcher, put it on the table. <laughs> I'm, waiting. I'm waiting for the uh, enthusiasm, which is not coming. And she has, we used to, uh, we used to have a, uh, an orange squeezer, right? As if you, you had a half an orange and you, you did it on the squeezer and you get, and, and if you're lucky, you got about a half a glass out of it. So the, she was not impressed with this gigantic, uh, this gigantic orange juice thing. So now I'm waiting for the big, the big deal, the big deal. I pull out the, the sugar, thing and I'm, I'm, I'm actually showing my mother I opened the top and I showed her the mechanism that counts you know a one spoonful two spoonfuls what do you think mom she didn't uh, say a word she then went to the kitchen table picked up a spoon says this is all I need and if I ever was heartbroken in front of my mother for not satisfying her uh, heart's desires, that was it. So <laughs> I don't think I ever went back to Steeple Chase poker again. I uh, I don't know whether what's the deal on questions, or when do you want to do the questions, or do you have questions? What's the story? We want to hear your stories. We don't. Want, they don't. No one here wants to hear what my, my okay. stories. Well, uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, as I mentioned, as I mentioned. I, uh, I had a best friend. And uh, in those days, best friends were very, very important and, and revered, uh, really uh, revered. And my, friend, my best friend was Howie Sparrow. I told you all about uh, Sparrowy food products and so on and so forth. Well, this was also, this was also uh, around 1943. And uh, one of the things that uh, both of us liked to do was ride a bike. Now, in 1943-44, uh, the war was on, and no bicycles were made. And we didn't have a bike. E neither of us had a bike. But uh, two blocks from Ebbets Field, where the Dodgers played, and not far from where uh, Howie had moved, by the way. That was a big deal. Because the parents made, were making a lot of dough. So they moved from Verdon Avenue to 602 Montgomery Street on, uh, uh, it was in Crown Heights. It was about uh, seven blocks from Evans Field. And I used to visit Howie uh, uh, there when we, uh, you know, we weren't going to Seagate. So one day we decided we wanted to go bike riding. And the title of this, which is in Tales of Brooklyn, right? That's me on the cover, by the way. Age four, ice skating on double runners on Vernon Avenue. Howie and I decided that we go bike riding. And uh, what we did was we went to Rogers Avenue right near uh, the ballpark. And there was a bike store and you could rent a bike and it was very cheap, you know, it was like, uh, whatever it was, it was a buck or less. 
and you didn't have to leave your uh, your wallet or your glasses or anything for a deposit. They trusted you in those days. And we got on the bikes. But we didn't, uh, by the way, it, the title of this chapter was How We Discovered Staten Island. Okay, that was the title. That's the title in the book. So now Howie and I are on the bikes. A beautiful, beautiful, sunny summer day. We didn't know what the heck we were going to do. We just started riding. So we ride over to Ocean Parkway, which was one of the great boulevards and still is one of the great boulevards of Brooklyn. Now we go a little bit down Ocean Parkway and all of a sudden Howie says, hey, look what's here. And uh, it, was a, uh, it wasn't as big as Ocean Parkway, but it was a parkway and it was Fort Hamilton Parkway. And neither of us knew anything from Fort Hamilton Parkway, but how he says, why, why don't we give it a shot? Okay, so we take a right turn and we're going down Fort Hamilton Parkway and we're looking around like this is part of Brooklyn we've never seen before because who go, you know, we don't go, you don't go too far out of Williamsburg when I was a kid. So we're riding along and riding along and all of a sudden we come, we come to the end of Fort Hamilton Parkway. It's unbelievable. And what are we? What's at the end of Fort pa Hamilton Parkway? Water, water. This was New York Bay, and we're looking around and looking around, and all of a sudden we see two signs. One sign on the left says to 69th Street Ferry, and there's the other sign said to 39th Street Ferry. Well, 69 looked better than 39 for whatever reasons, and we start pedaling over. We get to the 69th Street Ferry, and believe me, the most amazing thing about it was that there was a ferry there, and they were called electric ferries. I have a picture in the book, actually, of the electric ferry. And it was mostly, this is before there was a uh, Verrazano-Staten Island bridge from Brooklyn to Staten Island. The only way you get there was from the ferry at, down at the Battery, Staten, what Staten Island Ferry, but there were two Staten Island Ferries from Brooklyn. And we said, why don't we see where this thing goes? So we took the bikes on the ferry. I don't even think we had to pay anything. I'm sure we didn't have to pay. Anything. No, we didn't have to pay. Get to Staten Island. And this is like a new world for us. This is what, 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 what do we do now? And we see a sign that says, Victory Boulevard. I said, let's go up, let's take this and see where it goes. So we get on the on Victory Bull, and it was a very, very steep climb. And mind you, these, these were only one speed bikes, blue and tired bikes, nothing, no four, five, six, or 21 speed like today. And, but we were kids, you know, we had all kinds of energy and we're piling, flying, climbing up Victory Boulevard. And all of a sudden, Victory Boulevard levels off and we're riding maybe a quarter of a mile on Victory Boulevard leveled off. And we see on the right, this sign, it says Silver Lake Park. And we take a look at Silver Lake Park and we didn't see any lake. So we said, the hell with this. And we get back on the bike and we're riding, riding a little more. And all of a sudden we come to another park and it says Clove Lakes Park. And it was a lake. Right <laughs> So we said, I don't know anybody we we got to we got we got to try this place. We we parked the bikes, rented the rowboats, and now we're having a great time rowing in Clove Lakes Park. And then we'll stay with me and you'll run out. What? The first couple of times it's there, and you'll run out. Yeah. Does that work? Right. Is there a problem? Is there a problem? Somebody's not muting themselves, and they should. Am I okay? You're okay. We can hear you fine, Stan. Okay. So now, so now we have a great time rowing in Clover. And uh, we're going down the hill. It's just the greatest. Now, for a kid at that time, we were about... Uh, 11 or 12 years old, to be on a balloon tired bike to go down what was like an endless hill was one of the most exciting things in my life up until then. It was just, 
and and of course there were hardly any cars around, so that made it even better. We get to the ferry, get to the ferry, get on the electric ferry, have a wonderful, wonderful ride back to Brooklyn. <laughs> we then uh, went, we decided to go to Alan Shirley's candy store, and we get there. And the guy said, so uh, where were you guys today? And uh, we said, or I said, we discovered Staten Island. And Staten Island to us was like the new world. It was like the new world. And nobody, nobody, nobody in Alan Shirley's candy store could figure out what the hell that was all about. So we had to tell them about Victory Boulevard. We had to take them about, tell them about uh, Clover Lakes Park and the rowboats and the whole spiel and the electric ferries. And that was, that was, that to us was a very important, very important thing in, in our lives. Another very important thing in my life was music for a lot of reasons. First of all, my parents, uh, Molly and Ben Fischler, uh, love music and they love to dance. And uh, watching them dance what was called the one step, which was fast, uh, usually to a, a jazz tune, uh, was very exciting for me to see because they did it well and you could see that they, they were loving it. And uh, my mom and dad, every day there was some sort of music in the house. In the morning at breakfast, they had WOR on and uh, the John Gambling Show. They had a live uh, four-piece orchestra, a four-piece band playing stuff. It was always music, music and music. And one of the musical instruments that we had was a very, very old Victrola. Now, to make the Victrola work, it had a crank. And you had to first uh, crank it up. You had to put the uh, 78 RPM uh, record, the disc, which had two sides to it, by the way, uh, on the uh, on the turnabout, and then you had to. It was everything was 78 RPM, so there's nothing to worry about with the, any 45 or 33 or any of that stuff. And uh, the first uh, record that I remember getting was Playmates uh, with K Kaiser's band. Oh, playmate, come out and play with me and bring your dollies three, crying up by apple tree. I loved it. Loved that. Played it over and over. Then the next one that I bought, which you could get a record then for uh, uh, 10 cents, 10 cents. I got uh, Bob Crosby's Bobcats. Uh, doing the little red fox. Yeah, 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 said the little fox. Yeah, yeah, you can't catch me. Yeah, 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 said the little fox, singing merrily. Pardon my monotone, but everybody in the family had a monotone. So when we had a birthday, we only sang the first verse of Happy Birthday because nobody could stand the rest of it because we all had monotones. So I am, I'm collecting, uh, collecting records and one after another, I love, love music. So one day, Howie and I went downtown Brooklyn. This was, again, right uh, during the war. It was 1944. And we used to visit the department stores. This was usually before the holidays, which meant the uh, most important part of the uh, department store to us was the toy department. Usually it was on the sixth floor. There were three big department stores. There was Frederick Loges, there was Nams. This is all on Fulton Street, which was our, basically our Broadway. So it was Frederick Loges, of course, the street from the RKO Albee, which was a great movie house. Loges, Nams, and then the biggest one of all was A&S, Abraham and Strauss. And Abraham and Strauss had just built a, like a uh, a mini skyscraper department store. So that was that was the big deal. So now we're in A&S, and uh, for some reason, they had on the same floor as the toy department, they had what uh, was a, uh, they had a, a regular piano, 
And this guy was a, a song, a sheet music seller. So he would be playing tunes. And if you liked the tune, he would sell you the sheet music. Sheet music was the big thing then. If you didn't buy the record, you had a piano and somebody could play the piano. So you'd buy the sheet music. And uh, things like uh, the words to songs were in actually a monthly, you get a monthly magazine. It would have all the words to all the pop tunes on a hit parade for that particular month. So anyhow, we're in, uh, we're in this uh, portion of a and and there was this grand piano. And there's this, this guy, and he starts playing a tune. And it, it, this is the first time I ever had this experience where I actually heard a song being played that I had not heard before. And it was like instant, instant love of the song. And of course, I didn't know what it was at the time, but then the guy pulls out the sheet music and people were buying it. I couldn't buy it because we didn't have a piano at the time. And the uh, tune happened to be Sentimental Journey, which was a, uh, a very significant uh, World War II song, uh, a very big song. And uh, the uh, vocalist was Doris Day, who went on to uh, stardom in Hollywood. At that time, she was with uh, Les Brown and his band of renown. And uh, when I got home, I told my mom that uh, I heard this, this song. She said, I never heard of it either. I said, well, I think it's going to be a, a real biggie. She said, well, if it's a real biggie, then uh, you can get it at, uh, we had a, uh, a record store two blocks away on Willoughby and Tompkins. And uh, that's where I got uh, my sentimental journey. But I, I have to tell you, the most popular song that I uh, ever played on my old Victrola, and you, by the way, the Victrola required needles. And uh, you'd have to buy a pack of needles, you know, it would be about maybe, uh, uh, 40 needles or 30 needles. And after a while, you had to loosen the needle holder, take out the old one and put a new needle in, screw it tight. And then when, uh, after you wound it up and you op you know, put the on lever on and the thing started to turn, then you took the actual needle part and put it onto the record. Now that meant if you played a record for a long time, long enough time, the black vinyl would actually change color. And the color that it would wind up being is silver. And if the record had silver, that meant it was played a hell of a long time, many times, many times. And I had one record of my whole collection that actually turned silver. And I'm sure nobody uh, could ever guess it because it was an unusual tune. It was uh, Jack Benny's band leader. It was Phil Harris uh, doing That's What I Like About the South. Won't you come with me to Alabama? There, go see my dear old mammy. She's frying eggs and broiling hammy. And that's what I like about the South. There comes Bob with all the news. He's got the back back coat and the button shoes and he's all dressed up in his union dues. And that's what I like about the South. Don't take one, take two. They're dark brown and chocolate too. Suits me and must suit you. And that's what I like about the South. I know that tune backwards. That was my favorite tune. I was a Phil Harris fan after that. And he only did a couple of tunes. He did, uh, the other side was a nothing tune. He did one called the Darktown Poker Club, which was a sensational tune, but nothing, nothing matched. And that, that's what I like about the South. And you can look up Phil Harris. That's what I like about the South on your computer. And you will find uh, a video of Phil Harris doing it in, uh, in a movie. 
and I played it for all my my grandchildren. And the okay, great thing about uh, Stan, the, yeah, Stan, what? Okay, we want to interrupt now to have questions and answers if we can. Okay. Okay. Hello. All right. I'm ready. I have uh, uh, not exactly a question. I, I just it, it's a very brief story, but it's a, you know it's a Stan Fishel story, so I think I can get away with uh, telling it. Uh, when I was a kid in school, uh, uh, the only thing my teachers really liked about me is that at the end of the year, when I handed in my books, they were in the exact same condition as when they were given to me. Uh, I don't think I cracked a book as a kid in school, but I read Stan Fischler books on hockey, and my parents were just thrilled I was reading anything. <laughs> so thanks, Stan. I really appreciate those books. Well, that's uh, what they, why they invented the Yiddish word nachas. I get a lot of nachas from uh, different people over the years. And uh, hearing that, uh, just I guess the best word for my reaction is that swell. Uh, I, I, I appreciate that, appreciate that. And I think uh, looking back, my legacy uh, will be books as much as anything. Um, and uh, and I'm, I, I'm so happy that I was able to do this book because the back picture will be interesting. That's me on the top of Ebbets Field, which is a story I will tell later if we have time. But that's a very unique picture. I am, I am on the top of the night lights at Ebbets Field, right above center field. Uh, a good story is here, but I'll let you guys ask more questions. Go ahead. Did you have any interaction at all with Adam Fox, who was the first uh, Jewish ranger? He's not the first at all. There've been, uh, uh, before Adam Fox, there was High Buller, who uh, was in 51 as a rookie, was second all-star. Uh, before him, there was Max Labovich. Before Max, there was um, Alex Levinsky, who had one of the uh, great nicknames in uh, of Jewish hockey. Alex Levinsky's nickname was Mind Boy because his mother would go to all the games and she'd say to her neighbor, that's Mind Boy Alex out there for the Rangers. Do you have any stories with my rink rat buddy Stan here, Mr. Stanley Cup? Well, uh, you want to hear a Stanley Cup story? Please. Well, uh, well, first of all, one of the one of the great stories was how the when the Montreal Canadiens uh, won the Stanley Cup, they brought it to a studio on St. Catherine Street in Montreal called uh, Rice's, and the team uh, uh, did individual and uh, a group picture with the Stanley Cup. And uh, they were in such a great mood that they all walked out and they left the Stanley Cup in Rice's studio. And a cleaning lady came that night and she looked at this thing. She didn't know what the heck the Stanley Cup was, but she figured this would be a nice place to put the geraniums. So she filled it up with water, put the flowers in it. And about two or three days later, somebody in charge of the Stanley Cup says, where's our Stanley Cup? And they couldn't figure out where it was. And finally, they put three and four together and they went back to Rice's and it was still, <laughs> the geraniums still were pretty fresh in Stanley's cup. Well, when they let me touch it, they, we were a lot nicer to it. Well, there's a lot of, you know, the uh, when, when the Islanders won the cup in uh, 1980, it was passed around and Clark Gillies, may he rest in peace, uh, he had it in his house and he filled it up with the dog biscuits and uh, the uh, the pet canine had uh, a couple of nice meals and somebody asked him, so why would you do that? And he said, Clark says, well, he's a nice dog. Why not? Uh, and uh, when the Pittsburgh Penguins won their first cup, I thought this was uh, in excess. Uh, Mario Lemieux had a party at his swimming pool and a couple of the guys were jumping in the water with the cup, but 
and that's the way it was. That's uh, they now they're becoming more strict. Uh, when the Lightning won the Cup two years ago, one of the uh, players got drunk and he slipped and fell with the cup and uh, put a dent in it. So uh, now it's uh, under uh, strictly uh, strict non kosher supervision. As to that, the, the man, stand, uh, the man yeah, standing next to me here was is the Stanley Cup's official guardian. <laughs> Very good. Any others? Hey, Stan, how'd you get your start with the Rangers? Well, I could say Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, uh, because that was my entree. Uh, in 1939, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was the biggest hit for a kid, you know, like Star Wars and the other cockamamie crazy kids' movies now. Any kid in 1939 to be certified as a kid had to see Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So one, one Sunday after or Sunday morning, my dad says to me, I'm going to take you to see Snow White. I was so excited. I said, where, Dad? He said, the Globe Theater. It's in Times Square. It's about 45th Street. So we jump in the subway. We get off at the closest spot, which was 50th and 8th. We get out. It's like a downpour. It was like sheets and sheets and sheets of rain. We didn't have an umbrella. And... My father says, you know, the Globe Theater is about six, six blocks from here, Stanley. And he looks up and right in front of us was Madison Square Garden. The old garden was on 8th Avenue between 50th and 49th. And we were right at the corner at 50th and 8th. And my father sees that it's hockey, to, hockey today. Not Ranger hockey, but Rovers hockey. Rovers with a Ranger farm team. He says, I'm going to take it to, to a hockey game. And I started to cry. What the hell did I know from hockey? I want to go see Snow White. He's taking me to a hockey game. I was bawling and bawling. And just like, just like with the Oxblood colored Joe Medwick club for six bucks, he didn't give in to me. He yanked me into the garden. And, and I was so furious that I had to do something to get even with my father. So I realized he was rooting for the home team, the Rovers. And they're playing Washington, so I, I'm I'm going to root for this other team against my father. And Washington Washington Eagles had a guy named Normie Burns who was blonde, and I identified him with my favorite radio cowboy, the Lone Ranger. And Normie Burns scored a hat trick, three goals. My guys won. My father lost. I felt pretty good. Next day, I go to school. PS fifty four. We do a thing called Show and Tell. I don't know whether you know what it is. Oh, but yeah. Mrs. Gould called on me, and I show and told about a goalie, a hockey goalie that I saw the day before. Fascinated me. She gave me an A. An a. I got an A out of hockey. I said, this hockey ain't too bad. Next Saturday, Dad took me to see Snow White. On the way home, I said, you know, Dad, I'd like to see another hockey game tomorrow. And that's how I started, going to the garden with my father to see the Rovers. I actually got my start with the Rangers much later. In 1951 or 50, the Rangers started a fan club, the Rangers fan club. And I joined the fan club and we were able to put out a, uh, a monthly paper called the Rangers Review, me and two other guys, Freddie Meyer, who's still a buddy of mine. And uh, we, I, you know, being that we were in the fan club in those days, it was easy access to players. Nobody was a big shot. The best guy in the Rangers made $10,000 a season. That, that's, that's the difference. And we were able to interview guys for our newsletter, Ranger Fan Club newsletter. And I remember in, me and Freddie Meyer interviewed Eddie Coleman of the Rangers in his hotel room across the street from the garden. And I began to have access. And I went to Tommy Lockhart in 40, uh, I'm sorry, in my last year of college. I was at Brooklyn College. at 53, and he went, Tommy Lockhart ran the Rovers in the Eastern League. And I went up to him, and I said, I'd like to write a newsletter for your league, free. He says, go ahead. So every week, I'm handing the newsletter. It was circulated throughout the Eastern League, and it meant I was up at the garden, and the guys were noticing me. And when I 
I graduated from Brooklyn College in 1954. I got a call from Herb Gorin, who was the Rangers press agent, who already knew me because I was always around there. He said, how would you like to come and work for us in publicity? And it was as if I was entering heaven. Hockey haven was hockey heaven to me. Or hockey heaven was hockey haven. And I spent the year working for the Rangers. And my, that was the first time I was getting paid in any hockey business. And that's where my career took off. So when people ask me, you know, who do you root for? You root for the Islanders? You root for the Devils? I always tell them I'm even. I'm like the song from uh, Finian's Rainbow, great musical from 1949. And the tune was, when I'm not near the girl I love, I love the girl I'm near. So when I worked for the Devils, I rooted for the Devils. When I worked for the Rangers, I rooted for the Rangers. When I did Islander games, I rooted for the Islanders. So I always tell Ranger fans, I'm eternally grateful to the Rangers because I got my first gig there. 50 bucks a week. Loved it. Would have worked for nothing. In the middle of the season, I used to go in seven days a week because it was, it was heaven to me. In the middle of the season, uh, my boss, Herbie Gorin, comes over to me and he says, we're giving you a raise. I got 55 bucks, an extra five bucks without even asking for it. And that's how it all began. Snow White started. <laughs> I'd like and, to uh, what's, you. your, what's your favorite uh, Bruin story or anecdote about the Boston Bruins? Well, uh, first of all, <laughs> I... Uh, I hated the Bruins uh, because I hated the Bruins because in uh, you know 4950 the Rangers went to the Cup final and Lynn Patrick was the coach and he walked out on the team to become coach of the Bruins and we hated him for that and we hated the Bruins for luring him away and uh, as it happened uh, we didn't make the playoffs. For years after Lynn Patrick uh, uh, did a Benedict Arnold on us, and I, uh, but there were things about the Bruins that were fascinating, and one was the Thanksgiving doubleheader. On uh, the day before Thanksgiving that night, it was a tradition that the Bruins played at Madison Square Garden, and then on Thanksgiving night. The Rangers played the Bruins at Boston Garden. And I decided that, uh, I was in the fan club then, I decided that uh, I was going to go to the game at the Garden at MSG, and just a block away on 50th and 8th was a Greyhound bus terminal. I'm going to take a Greyhound bus to Boston. I'm going to check into the Manga Hotel, which was next to Boston Garden, I found out. And I'm going to see the game and then come home. And in those days, there was no New, uh, no New England Turnpike. Uh, it was Route 1. It was an awful trip. Awful, awful trip. I got, got to Boston 6 in the morning get out of the bus and I was it was I was punchy I was really punchy and I I was told that if you take the subway you bring it to the uh, Boston Garden Causeway Street and the Manga Hotel so I go down into the subway and all of a sudden I think I'm hallucinating instead of a subway car coming in it was a trolley car who ever heard of a trolley car in the subways? But that's the way it was in Rinky Dink Boston. So I went to the uh, I went to the Manga Hotel, and uh, I, I went to a game, and that was my uh, you know my first experience at a live Bruin game at Boston Garden. It was the first of, of many. I later found out that the uh, Manga Hotel 
was actually part of a stand-up comics gag in Boston. And the gag, well, the way it was built, the manger was part of three structures. They built the garden in 1928, and they built the garden over uh, a North Station, which was the Boston and Main Terminal, and the hotel over the uh, station. So it was an engineering feat, but the problem was every so often when the trains came in, it, it would vibrate. So anyhow, the gag was a couple comes, uh, checks in the manga, they go into room 204. The husband says he's gonna take a walk down to the Charles River. The wife says she's gonna take a nap. He goes out and she's in bed and she's about to fall asleep. And all of a sudden a train comes into North Station, the room vibrates, she falls on the floor. Gets back into bed, she's about to fall asleep again. Now the train comes in, she falls on the floor. So in 10 minutes, she's on the floor five times. She calls up the manager. He says, what's the matter? She says, every time a train comes in, I fall on the floor. He says, that's impossible. She says, you come up and, and I'll show you. So five minutes later, knock on the door. She opens the door. There's the manager. He says, please come in and get into bed with me. So the manager climbs into bed. All of a sudden, a husband walks in, sees the guy in bed with his wife. He says, what the hell are you doing there in bed? And the manager looks up at the guy and says, you won't believe this, but I'm waiting for a train to come in. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so uh, I, I got to know guys on the Bruins over the years. Some of them were nice guys. And of course, Derek Sanderson uh, became my pal. And I, I, I ghost wrote his book, I've Got to Be Me. And uh, I did a Bobby Orr on the Big Bad Bruins, which was the best-selling hockey book I ever did. So how that, those are two good Boston stories in one gag. Uh, Stan, I'm a big fan of yours. And, uh, you know, Islander fan these days, but I remember my Ranger days. I used to go with my G.O. card for 75 cents, go, go to the Madison Square Garden, sit upstairs, then move down to sit right on the rail on the concrete steps. We were never bothered. But my, the greatest routine was I loved Steve Allen. And every Sunday I'd go to the game and then be a bus outside the old garden taking you to What's My Line with Steve Allen. That's how they got people to, you know, on a Sunday night to come to the show. They'd have a bus at MSG. And I also remember the locker rooms. We used to wait for Roger Bear and we used to walk through Times Square, you know, just like he was a regular guy. He was terrific. But my question to you was, uh, again, you know, being an Islander fan, how did you feel about the way Tavares left? Were you close with him? You know, have any feelings on it, the way he left the Islanders? Well, first of all, I had to be close with him. Uh, I interviewed, I was the first one to interview him after he was drafted. I was up in Montreal. And very interesting story because I love to joke, tell players jokes at the right time. And uh, he was drafted and they brought him into uh, the studio. And uh, I had heard a, uh, a good joke and I told it to him. And it was like talking to the Sphinx. So I said, I got problems with this guy. So now he comes to the team and he's the captain. And because he's the captain, he's the first guy I got to interview after every game because that was one of my jobs. And he was a good guy, he was a good guy. And uh, in fact, one of the nicest things was in terms of Tavares and me, was uh, shortly after my wife Shirley died, uh, he came over to me and uh, offered uh, personal condolence. I liked the guy for that. I liked him. I didn't think he was a superstar, but he was, uh, he was a good, very good player. And uh, I was uh, convinced in my mind, in fact, I had lunch with the owner, one of the two owners, John Ledecky, and he asked me, uh, do you think he's going to stay? And I said, no, I don't. I just had bad vibes. But uh, I was angry. I was furious when he left. There was a conference call, press conference, and I laid it to him. I, 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 I gave him a very tough question, and he gave me a half-assed answer. And the fact that I was the only one who really grilled him got a lot of attention. Uh, to this day, 
I have uh, my son Simon uh, hates him still, roots against Toronto. My granddaughter uh, Abigail hates him. And uh, I, I have to tell you, uh, to this day, in my heart of hearts, I root against him because of what he did. He, uh, he gave, it, it was unfair. Uh, he had an opportunity to say uh, he's going to go to Toronto and give the, the Islanders an opportunity to uh, pick somebody in a trade. And uh, he, he gave the Islanders a jobbing. Uh, so en enough said. He's an asterisk. He's an asterisk next to the question, uh, next to the line. You should be nice to everybody. Well, there are uh, exceptions. Also, how did you, did you ever have any dealings with James Dolan at all? Well, uh, James is the son of Chuck Dolan. Chuck Dolan is the one who gave me my first NHL gig uh, doing the Islander game starting in uh, March 1975. I'm in, uh, indebted to life to Chuck Dolan for starting Sports Channel, for uh, taking over the garden. And um, I knew Jimmy since he was a little pisher uh, at his father's uh, July 4th <coughs> uh, beachfront parties. Um, I, but I never had any uh, you know, real dealings with him other than to say hello. But I like the guy. I like the guy because he's a Dolan and he's the son of the guy who put me in business. Any good Barry Beck stories? Barry Beck? Yeah, I got one for you. Uh, one of my interns was a, a kid named Craig Wolf. He was going to, uh, I think he was going to Syracuse or one of the upstate colleges. And he mailed me some of his stories. And I could tell that this guy had the goods. So uh, he became an intern of mine. And he wound up uh, being the ranger reporter for the New York Times when Barry Beck was the uh, captain and Herb Brooks was the coach. And during a practice uh, at which only Craig was there, he witnessed Herb Brooks calling Barry Beck a coward. Imagine that calling your big, tough defenseman a coward. And uh, Craig Wolf wrote the story, caused a sensation. And um, so there's your Barry Beck story. Did you ever see Tom Ranger defenseman Tom Laidlaw break a stick over his head? No, but Tom Laidlaw became a very successful agent and is a good friend of mine. I never saw that. Hey, Stan, in, in your career in the league, you've seen a lot of great players, you know, going back probably to like guys like Gordy Howell and Bobby Hull, you know, then the guys, the, the, uh, the superstars on, on the Islanders and then on the Oilers, you know, great, the, the great one. In, in, in your opinion, just although they might have all different played different styles of hockey, who do you think was the greatest hockey player ever? Well, no doubt, Gordie Howe, greatest ever. He could play, he could stuff Wayne Gretzky into his pocket and carry him. Gordie Howe could do everything. He was he was the best fighter in the league. He was the best passer in the league. He was the best scorer in the league, and he was the best leader. He was he was everything, and he was also very dirty. And in those days, you could get away with uh, uh, dirty hockey. The rules were a little more uh, relaxed uh, than they are now, much more relaxed than they are now. So, um, but Gordy Howe was basically a forward, although he did play a little bit of defense. Uh, the greatest defenseman, uh, now again, this is not fair in one sense. How do you compare a 1939 Cadillac with a, a present day Cadillac? They're two different, it, it's totally different. The game was totally different when, uh, say, 
a defenseman like Ching Johnson was playing for the Rangers. They didn't wear helmets. The skates were different. The ice was different. Everything, everything was different. But if, if I were to pick a best defenseman, I'd pick Danny Potvin because Benny, Danny Potvin could score. He was a very, very tough hitter. And he was a great leader. He was a, he was a captain. And he captained the Islanders to four Stanley Cups. He captained the Islanders to 19 straight consecutive series, playoff series victories. Now, uh, as far as goaltending, I would take Glenn Hall because Glenn Hall played, listen to this, Glenn Hall played 502 consecutive games in goal without a mask. Uh, today, any, you ask any goalie, would he ever get into the net without a mask? He says, what are you, crazy? So th those, are, those are my favorites. I'll tell you another one of my favorites. Her name is Agnes, and she hasn't asked me a question. Thank you, Stan, but I'm not going to interfere with all these wonderful gentlemen. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Stan. It's a pleasure. You're welcome. Always. And I just have one thing to say to you, a big kiss from me. <laughs> you made my night, kid. <laughs> well, your day, it's your day. Uh, any other questions? She said, she said you don't need a publicist because you're doing a pretty good job. <laughs> Any Whose hockey questions? stick is that behind you, Stan? Oh, uh, I'm in my granddaughter's. My granddaughter is 18, and uh, she play, she's playing hockey right now. Uh, in Israel, there are not many rinks, but in a, a town called Matula, which is a 45-minute drive from here, uh, there's an Olympic-sized rink. And this is where my uh, three grandchildren from here, learn to uh, learn to play, and uh, that's one of her sticks. She's a very keen Islander fan, and her boyfriend is a goalie, so uh, they're keeping they're keeping hockey uh, in the family. Um, that 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 explains <laughs> that that explains uh, the uh, the hockey stick. Any more? I have one. I'm going to have one more. Last story, but I'll take questions up until. Hey, Stan, a uh, qu quick question. Have you ever heard of a uh, hockey player with devils named Uli Hemer? Yes, I do. I, uh, I did games when he was playing defense. He was a German. German, uh, big guy, pretty good, pretty good. Uh, not great, but uh, but that was when the team was uh, not so hot. Uh, now they're the, one of the hottest teams in the league. But I do remember him well. But uh, he was not he was not in the uh, All Star category anymore. What's your favorite hockey memory? Oh boy, you know I have I'll I'll preface that with a story. When Bobby Orr was the in his prime, one of the greatest defensemen of all time, a guy from Life magazine went up to Parry Sound, Ontario, and interviewed uh, Bobby Orr's mother. And one of his questions to her, Mrs. Orr, he said, uh, "What of your? What do you think of your son?" And she said, "Which one?" <laughs> and there, there, there have been uh, so many, so many different thrills. Give me the question one more time. And while you're giving it to me, I'll give you an answer. Give me that question again. What's your very favorite hockey memory? Okay, it was, it was the, uh, it was the fourth playoff series of the Islanders. So that would have been 83. They were playing the Edmonton Oilers with Wayne Gretzky and Mark Messier. And they were heavy favorites to beat the Islanders. The Islanders already won three in a row. They were basically beat up, tied out. And the Islanders uh, beat them the first two games in Edmonton. Then there was the third game. The Islanders beat them at the Islanders. And between the third and the fourth game, there was a league luncheon where players and the coaches from all teams were there. 
And the coach of the uh, oil is Glenn Sather got up, very uh, brash, almost brazen. He predicted that his team is going to come back and win. So uh, we had a pretty good hate on for the Oilers. So my greatest thrill was when the Islanders pumped that last goal in in game four to win their fourth straight cup. We got even with those Schnurrers in Edmonton and, uh, and we did what no other team, no other American team had done and still hasn't done. Still hasn't done. No team, no American team has won four straight cups. And that's not Cotson Cups, which is my what my grandmother used to call me. Stan, what's what's your best uh, hockey fight memory? Hockey fight? What was your best hockey fight? No question. It was uh, Hal Fontanato at the Garden. I was there, uh, practically st sitting above them in the press box. Hal was behind the net, uh, high sticking with Eddie Shack of uh of the uh, rangers and louis fontanato was considered then uh, the heavyweight champion of the league comes skating in because he had a grudge against how uh he skated in and practically pushed shack out of the way and started punching how and after how took the second punch he he just punched the behooses out of uh, Fontanato uh, so badly that Louis had to be taken to the hospital and kept in the hospital uh, overnight, overnight. And uh, from that point on, Fontanato was never the same. Uh, it's considered the best one-on-one -on -one in terms of the damage done. Uh, another interesting one was uh, Clark Gillies beating the crap out of uh, Eddie Hospodar of the Rangers. Now, Gillies was not a fighter. He didn't like to fight. But if you kept bugging him, watch out. And this Hospodar of the Rangers was a tough guy, and he kept bugging Gillies, and Bucky's, Gillies kept saying, stop, stop, stop. And finally, in one of the uh, playoff games, uh, Gillies was sort of involved with some scrum, and somebody hit him from behind, and he turned around, and it was Hospodar. And he destroyed Hospodar. He destroyed Hospodar. They took Hospodar to Polyclinic Hospital. Next day, Frank Brown, who was an intern of mine, now covering the ranges for the Daily News, he went to visit Hospodar in the hospital. Afterwards, he called up his desk, his sports editor, and sports editor uh, says, what are you doing, Frank? He says, I'm at poly Polyclinic Hospital. He says, well, what are you doing there? He says, well, I just interviewed a guy who once looked like Eddie Hospital. That's how, that's how, <laughs> that's what a job Gillies, Gillies did on him. What's your favorite hockey nickname? Hospitars was Boxcars, Leaping Louie, Slat Sather. What's your favorite nickname? I have two favorites. One of my favorite players, players, full name was Maxwell Herbert Lloyd Max Bentley who wound up his career, by the way, with the Rangers. He came from okay. Delisle, Saskatchewan, and he skated like a scared jackrabbit. He's very hard to catch him. And his nickname was the Dipsy Doodle Dandy from Delisle. Now, the best nickname of all was a terrible goalie that the Rangers had during World War II. His name was Steve Bozinski. Steve Bozinski's nickname was Steve Bozinski, the Buck Bozinski. <laughs> well, I've never heard of either of them. Thank you. That's why I'm here. <laughs> there you go. Kurt Beck was a, was a big puppy for the uh, Rangers. What's that? Kurt Beck. Any more? Yes. Uh, oh. Uh, can you hear me, Stan? Yeah, go. Okay. Uh, I well, I I grew up in Coney Island. My father was an attorney for fifty years on Mermaid Avenue. My grandfather built the Mermaid Theater. Wow. And when I was uh, sixteen, my parents moved to Seagate, and coincidentally, 
I lived in Staten Island for 30 years. Everything you spoke about. Now, did you belong to a shul in Coney Island? What's that? Did you belong to a synagogue? Not in Coney. Not in Coney. Where did you live? I'm sorry, I missed the beginning. Where did you live? Because I thought you lived in Coney. Where did you Where did you live? In, uh, I lived in Williamsburg, and our shul uh, congregation, Beth Jehuda, was on Bedford between Willoughby and Myrtle, and I was bar mitzvahed from a conservative shul on Park Place near Kingston, called Temple Sharazadik, the Gates of oh. Righteousness. Righteousness. And my opening line in the speech, my dear parents, grandparents, no. relatives, and friends, this is the most important day of my life. Now, the reason I had, I missed the beginning and you start talking about Coney Island, so I thought you were from Coney Island. I don't know why. Yeah. I know a mermaid uh, theater story. Yeah, right. <laughs> my father... <laughs> My Go father ahead. played the silent uh, organ there for his during the when they had an organ. Wow, wow! What school did you go to? What high school, Lincoln? I went to Yeshiva. I went to Yeshiva. So, wow. oh, okay, okay. Well, uh, do you I know, didn't go to Lincoln. I went to Yeshiva. Do you know the gag about the difference between Orthodox, conservative, I'm, 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 and Reformed? No, what? What? That this uh, orthodox guy buys a Bentley. You know what a Bentley is? A car? Very expensive Bentley. Goes to his orthodox rabbi. He says, uh, Rabbi, can you give a barucha for my Bentley? He says, what are you, crazy? We don't have baruchas for car. He says, I'm very, very anxious to get a barucha for my Bentley. Can you recommend maybe a conservative rabbi? So he goes to Temple uh, uh, on... West End Avenue and 100th Street. And I'm on the, I'm on. Look at me. I can't. Look. Right. A conservative <laughs> rabbi, can you give a baruchah for my Bentley? He says, give me a minute to oh. think it over. I'll come back and tell you. He comes back. He says, no, it's not right. It's not right for giving a baruchah. Hey, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you mute yourself there, Mr. Harris? Okay. Harris. Yeah. Am I over? Is my done? Yeah, no, finish. you're not done. Please finish. So the conservative rabbi says he can't do a baruch. Okay, I'll, get the, I'll get the food in a few minutes. I was talking on Zoom. Okay, keep going, please. He says, can you recommend uh, maybe a reform rabbi uh, to give me a baruch? He says, go to the uh, five towns and see, uh, go to Temple Kervin Benai Shnaraz and uh, see, uh, see Rabbi Glickman. So he goes to Rabbi Glickman, the reform rabbi, and he says, Rabbi, can you do a baruch for a Bentley, my Bentley? And the rabbi looks at him, he says, a Bentley? I know what it is. What's a baruch? <laughs> that's a great one okay stan i got a question for you you know you mentioned Derek sanderson i remember seeing he he made a movie years ago about him now between Derek sanderson ron dugay and let's say uh greshna who is the biggest playboy partier that you knew from the hockey days who was the third one Greshner, Ron Greshner. Uh, Greshner, I would, uh, I would say, uh, long term, it would be Doogie. Uh, uh, Doogie was. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, spoke, I'm talking uh, from what I've heard. I don't, I didn't hang out with guys like that, and, uh, but Doogie was nonstop. In fact, he's, but they tell me now that uh, he's dating the former governor of Alaska. Uh, but Doogie, by the way, by the way, Doogie, uh, wonderful guy. Rex Greshner, wonderful guy. Uh, Rod, I, I ghosted Rod's book, uh, Go All My Life on Ice. Wonderful, wonderful guys. Now, uh, when I uh, celebrated my 90th birthday, uh, the Rangers invited me 
uh, to a game and they gave me, I could, I, I'd show it to you if I had it uh, off the wall. Uh, Brad Park, I ghosted his book, Play the Man, yeah. and Ronnie Greshner uh, presented me with a, a plaque with a program for my very first game in 1942, my first Ranger game. And uh, beautiful stuff, beautiful, beautiful stuff. Um, so I don't have anything, uh, you know, even uh, talking about Tavares. Look, he did what he felt he wanted to do, blah, blah, blah. So, but, uh, you know, hockey guys have been great guys. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, my buddy uh, Irving Rudd was the uh, press agent for the Brooklyn Dodgers when they were the boys of summer from 1950 until they left. And I ghosted Irving's book thanks to my friend Agnes. Agnes was the one who got me to do Irving Rudd's book. And Irving used to tell me about the Brooklyn Dodgers. And one day I said to Irving, what are these guys really like? And he quoted uh, from Charles Dickens, and he said about the Brooklyn Dodgers, there is not a rotter in the lot, not a rotter in the lot. And that's basically uh, what, what it is with hockey guys. You know, there's always one bad apple and one schlemiel uh, around, but uh, good guys and uh, the particular guys that you met, uh, meant, uh, you know, Doogie, good pal, good pal. Greshner, he was there to give me the plaque. Brad Park, same thing. So, uh, good fellas, good fellas, good movie, good fellas. Roger Bear brought him to beer when he came and skated with us in, in pickup hockey after he retired. That's how nice a guy he was. We wanted to buy him the beer. He brought beer for us. Well, I'll tell you about uh, uh, Steve Allen. When Steve Allen had his Tonight Show, before Christmas, he did a show from uh, Rockefeller Center Rink, and uh, he pretended to be the goalie, and Rod was the shooter. And Rod came down, and as Rod is about to shoot, Steve Allen turned the net around <laughs> backwards, and uh, Rod says, what are you doing that for? And Steve's punchline was, well, turn about is fair play. <laughs> that was... That was uh, that was his psych uh, with the gag. Uh, wonderful guys, wonderful. Did you think the gag line was the best line of all time? No, 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 no. Uh, the Rangers' first line of the Cook Brothers and Boucher was uh, certainly one of the greatest. Uh, there was there were a lot, a lot of the punchline with the Rocket Rashad and Toe Blake and Elmer Locke. Uh, just a, a lot, you know, great lines from different era, but the gag line was a very good line, but they never could win a cup. The Boucher-Cook line won cups for the Rangers in 28 and 33. Winning the cup makes a big difference, and they never did. They got knocked off by the Flyers. The evil empire. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. Let me just reiterate, if you guys are interested in my stories, you might like my book, Tales of Brooklyn, and you can get it via Amazon. And one of these minutes, I want to tell you what's behind this story. Okay? Any more questions? Anybody hear me? We oh, yeah. can hear you. We want to hear your story. Okay, so uh, you, you ready for this one? Yes. Okay, so I'm now working for the New York Journal American newspaper. The Journal American was Hearst's uh, flagship evening paper when uh, during the Hearst Empire. Uh, we had the largest circulation. And uh, one of my beats was writing feature stories. So the Dodgers had won the World Series in 1955, and now it's, it's the spring of 1956. And my sports editor, Max Case, K-A-S-E, one of the wonderful, wonderful sports editor, says, uh, I want you to go to Ebbets Field. I want you to do a story on how, how these guys are getting 
the ballpark ready for the new season. So I uh, grabbed hold of my uh, photographer, his name was Dick Hockman, and uh, we drive over to its field and we go out onto the uh, pitcher's mound and I'm interviewing the head groundskeeper and I had a bunch of Western Union uh, papers and I'm writing down all my answers, all my answers. And I finished the interview and I said, okay, Dick, I think we're, uh, we can go now. He says, no, 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 no. I want to get some uh, better pictures. And I said, okay, so where do you want to go? He says, let's go up on the roof. Now, Dick Hoffman didn't know that Fischler had a fear of heights, but I'm not going to tell him because I'm now doing a job for my paper and I have to listen to uh, what I'm told to do. So he says, let's go up on the roof. So now I'm really scared, but we, I, we go up to the roof. Now the roof on Ebbets Field, like in a, a lot of ballparks, it's not flat so that the rain can come off the roof. It's at an angle. So now we get up to the roof, we, we walk out and I see, well, is this a cockamamie roof with an angle? And I don't like that. And the next thing, even worse than that is what I heard Dick Hockman. He says, Dick, he says, Dick and I were at the home plate part of the roof. He says, let's go over, let's go take a walk around and, and see. So now we're, I'm walking in the middle, right? Like I'm not gonna, I don't want to slide off and fly over down into the grandstands. And I'm walking along, I'm very, very nervous, as you can imagine. And he says, let's go all the way to the lights at center field. Now this is the this is the farthest of the night the had the, the lights for the night games. So by the time we got to the center field, I'm ten times a nervous wreck. I said, "What do you want to do now, Dick?" He says, "I want to get a picture of you like you're examining the lights for the first night game." And what do you mean? I said, "What do you mean?" He says, what I want you to do is climb up this little ladder here and go up to the top. And then you're going to take out your papers and you're going to pretend that you're taking notes. Well, I mean, what's beyond being scared to the hundredth uh, power? But I got to do it, right? So this, is, this picture was taken. This is a very scared Fischler pretending to be writing down notes on the top rung, actually I'm above the lights at, uh, at Ebbets Field. Now, what the picture doesn't show you is what, I, what happened then. Hockman took, takes the pictures. He says, okay, you can come on down now. So I put my notes in my left jacket pocket. And as I'm very frighteningly <laughs> coming down the ladder, my jacket gets caught, gets caught in the ladder and the notes start flying out of my pocket. Now, this natural reaction when something like that happens is to try to grab them. But if I tried to grab them, I would be flying over the ball field like Icarus and I wouldn't be around to tell this tale to you. So I quickly uh, subdued my reflex and came down and we eventually went down to the uh, to center field and I, I retrieved the uh, notes and I went back to 220 South Street and <laughs> this is this is the story that inspired my uh, story the next day General American and uh, this is the book. Tales of Brooklyn. So uh, that was, a, that was, I would say that was one of the scariest moments of my entire life. And I had a picture to prove it. Oh, oh poop, he just froze. Oops, Dan, you're frozen. Don't move. Don't move. <laughs> Let's see if we get on. Uh, let's see, it's not my internet. My internet is just fine. Um, you under attack, Arab attack? Yeah, everybody's moving. Yeah, not. Uh, uh, we lost.
lost them. Yeah, it's his internet. So, is there a two hour limit or something? Could be two hour uh, Zoom limit. No, no, I, I paid no, we for got, uh, We got platinum. Yeah. <laughs> We've had the uh, Yom Kippur services yeah, service. that went. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That went like 10 hours. Oh, okay. Yeah, you've got platinum. You should be good. Yeah. So it look, looks like he, uh, he will drop. Maybe he dropped. Back, but I don't know that he knows how his, his yeah. tech support had to go. So that might be. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that Rob Greenspan? Yeah, Rob. Yeah, he's Rob. Dr. Rob. Yeah. Um, oh, well. Thank you to the men's club. I feel like I met the Maven. You guys are wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. We should write the stand and tell your friends and family about us. Yeah, spread the word. I'm going to buy his book. And I will. I'll spread the word about to, to all my rink rat buddies. But I think this is going to conclude the, uh, the show. The show. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for coming. We got some coffee. We got cookies and coffee. Got some cookies and coffee back there. You can have them virtually over there. Okay, thank you. Have a nice afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Mark Hilton, especially. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, yeah. Stan was great. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, he was. All right. Happy holidays. Happy Hanukkah, everybody. Same to you. Exactly. Bye-bye.